This is Punishment Martinez from Ring of Honor. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Welcome to another edition of Interactive Wrestling Radio right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. This week's guest, we are bringing you a sit-down interview with ROH superstar Punishment Martinez. Man, this guy is smart. In fact, everybody I talk to over at Ring of Honor is just incredibly intelligent. You got Frankie Kazarian, who was an incredible analytical guy, really thinks things through, really studies the intricacies of the stories that are told. Kelly Klein, I mean, I have an IQ of 147, and she made me feel like a mental midget. And this guy just gets it, and I really mean that. And that really is indicative of the ROH product. So happy for those guys' continued success. They're now on Comet Television, so be sure and check out Ring of Honor. Check your local listings. And thank you to Ring of Honor for helping us get Punishment Martinez on the air. I'm done. So, guys, be sure and check out WrestlingEpicenter.com for great other interviews just like this one. In fact, this is our 462nd interview. If you want to hear our other ones, check out the website. We got some on YouTube. We got some in MP3 format. Some on both. This is the pretty badass Kelly Klein. And you are listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio. Throw some metal, show a little skin. Looking for some trouble that she can get in. Come with me, I know where to go. I know what you like, I know what you want. Oh, no, Give it the gate, it's the top of the roster. No, she wants to go. Hey, this is the future Frankie Kazarian, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. On the Newsmaker line with us right now is a Ring of Honor rising star and one heck of a scary dude. He is Punishment Martinez. Mr. Martinez, are you with us? Yes, I am. How are you doing, man? I am doing great. I got to tell you, if there's one person I didn't want to be a few minutes late to, it's you, because... Uh, even even if the look wasn't scary enough, reading your bio and seeing that your dad took down Chuck Norris, I don't want to make you mad, so I apologize for that. <laughs> I'll let it slide. It's all good. All right. So here we are. We're, we're talking to you here tonight, and I, I guess I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you ended up in this crazy world of professional wrestling. How did you end up uh, getting involved? Because obviously, as we mentioned, your dad was a skilled karate fighter. What made you decide to go for the more artistic side of things with the wrestling? Well, like most uh, wrestlers today, I grew up watching it, was a big time fan, dreamed of doing it. And uh, we ended up having to close down our, we had martial arts schools. We ended up closing them down, moved. I moved around and then I became, came to the point where I didn't know what to do next. And a friend of mine said, why don't we do this wrestling thing that we always dreamt of doing? And uh, I didn't even know how to go about it. I was like, all right, well, what do we do? We just show up at a wrestling show and say, hey, we're wrestlers. And he said, no, we got to go to school and train. And he found a school in South Jersey, the Monster Factory. And I tried out, and the rest was history. Is that where you're from? Are you from the Jersey area? I'm from New York. Oh, okay. I should have guessed by the by the accent, but that that does make <laughs> a lot of sense. <laughs> I was, I I'm was from raised... North Jersey, too. Oh, okay. I was raised in Puerto Rico, so Spanish was my first language, and then I moved to the States when I was about 11 and lived in in the tri-state the rest the rest of the time, yeah. There you go. And that school that you were trained at, one of the more famous schools in the entire country, and that is the Monster Factory. So many huge names have come out of the Monster Factory. What is it about that school that gives these guys this, the skills and the set that you need to succeed? Well, over time, the Monster Factory has evolved as wrestling and has had different trainers and different facilities. Now, it's at a point where, because of the way athletes 
are trained these days to, in professional wrestling, it's become pretty much a mini performance center, so to speak, where there's amateur matches, a weight room, multiple rings, and it's not just in-ring training, you know, because, uh, like I said, wrestling has so many different dynamics to it now compared to, you know, yesteryears that it needed to evolve. But basically it was just, but it comes down to fundamentals and uh, being able to tell a story, just everything beyond just what you see as far as moves. It's what's before and after that's so important. And that's been the heart of the training of the Monster Factory. And it's the way it's making guys uh, do things the right way, be businessmen, treat this as a business. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, weeding out the bad folks that don't belong in our business. And that's been like the, the heart and soul of it. So I think that's why it's been so successful as far as breeding uh, popular and, and stars, so to speak. I would, I would be inclined to agree. And it definitely is, uh, definitely is one of the best schools out there. And you mentioned a couple things, but you mentioned um, kind of just saying, well, what do we do? Do we just show up and say that we're wrestlers? But obviously now you know there's a lot more involved in that. How much of a transition was it from you to go from a shoot style, for, as karate is, obviously, to the work style of wrestling? Was it a transition for you to kind of learn to work it all? It was odd. Uh, I mean, I knew going into it that, you know, I knew what wrestling was. I was a big fan. I used to go to, my dad would take me to every show at Madison Square Garden. So if WWE or as at the time was in Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm. I was there. I was there for the Survivor Series in 96, 96. when, when I was Taker there came too, down like a, <laughs> like a bat and, you know, and Sid beat Shawn Michaels. I was there for the click moment when uh, Diesel and Razor left. Uh, so many good shows that I saw there. But so I understood the business um, or at least the wrestling like, because I, I, I guess because I had a fighting background, I, although I was a fan and I loved professional wrestling and I loved the storylines, I still looked at it a little differently than probably most fans did, where I understood what they were doing and kind of appreciated how they made it look and, uh, and the physicality. So when I joined the school, I knew it was going to be hard for me. I knew that it was going to be hard on my body because obviously there's, this is tough. You know, I didn't go into it saying, oh, this is going to be easy and cake. It was still a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, but I was able to adapt very quickly. It, it was a little odd at first because in I didn't, I wasn't just into martial arts. I played all sports. I played football, basketball, baseball. And usually you're, you're taught to try to have control over your emotions. Where in pro wrestling, they want you to show emotion. You know, so that was the hardest transition was having to – let it out and just show emotion in everything we do opposed to hiding it because you don't want your opponent to see it or, you know, you know, your fan base or what you have a certain image that you have to maintain while you're in, in combat or, or in, in a game where in pro wrestling, no, it's the complete opposite. That's what tells the story. So that was a little hard for me at first, but I still adapted fairly quickly. And as far as the in ring, I was pretty good at, um, because I was, because of the martial arts, I believe it helped me so much with being able to, you know, fall and position myself and my footwork. Uh, it made the transition the transition a little bit easier. Um, the psychology and, and even the speaking, the promos, that was a little harder for me to to uh, learn to adapt to. Just because I I'm, just I'm never had admit, done that I'm before. I'm surprised by that. Yeah, uh, I, I just... say, I'll say that because of this, and please don't take this as a as a blowing smoke thing, but. Hearing your voice, you have a very booming and powerful voice. It certainly fits the character. I'm surprised that that would be something that you'd have trouble using as a tool. Well, well and that's I've heard that a lot. Um, the problem is, is that when you don't know what to say or when to say it, uh, it becomes challenging. So I could say words and sound menacing, but if it doesn't make sense for the moment, then it's just wasted words. Uh, mm -hmm. And... So that was, like I said, that was challenging and coming up with material and, uh, and just speaking in front of, like, let's say crowds or in front of a camera, it's really hard, um, because you don't know what facial expressions you're making while you're speaking, you know, you don't know what it looks like. So a lot of that, it took me time to develop, um, not to say that I'm expert or I'm perfect now, but obviously a lot better than I, I was when I started. So things like that was a little trickier for me to pick up, but 
like I said, once a lot of the other things, um, the martial arts definitely helped me. Um, and basically it has a lot to do with footwork and I knew how to, cause I was well balanced. And that's a problem with uh, pro wrestlers today. They come in with, uh, they want to move a thousand miles an hour and their feet want to keep moving when it's the opposite. You need to plant your feet, you know, and, and put, to position yourself for certain things. And I had that background and that base to help me. Absolutely. Now, one of the other assets that you have is your size. And I actually, do, doing my research for this interview, uh, one of the guys we interviewed twice this year, as a matter of fact, was the Monster Abyss. And I saw you guys have just a hell of a match. Um, I'm sure you wrestled several times, but the one I saw was just a hell of a match. I guess my question would be, you guys both being big guys, you're kind of a, almost a novelty in the way that wrestling is built these days. Obviously, there's a lot of big guys still out there, but compared to what it used to be when we were kids, and we're only about a year apart in age, I'm a year older than you, actually. Um, it was the land of the giants when we were kids, and nowadays it's you know probably about 60-40 to, to the smaller guys. Is it harder for you as a big guy now to be taken seriously by a very critical and very analytical wrestling crowd on the internet uh, because of your size? You raise a very good point, and I like the way you worded that. Uh, it is hard. Um, it, but it was just funny because pro wrestling, like you said, was all about the big men, and now our, the big men are the guys that people look at and they say, ah, oh, I don't, I don't want to watch this guy, which used to be the opposite. <laughs> uh, what happened? <laughs> no, but so it is harder, but uh, I, I kind of like the challenge a little bit because when you could succeed being the one that everybody expects to fail, it's just that much more better and gratifying for a viewer to enjoy. So I enjoy it more in, in putting in a performance because I know that if they're expecting the worst and you give them something good, they're going to see it as great. So if you give them something great, it's going to be special. So, and that's my goal. Um, so yeah, it, it's harder than it used to be. I don't think it's impossible because there's, there's actually a lot of big men that are athletic and they're doing a lot of very well for themselves nowadays. Um, but the style has changed. You, you, you don't see the generic big men. Um, anymore. You still have your classic big man, like you said, Abyss, who knows how to tell a story. So he doesn't have to rely on, you know, doing dives and flips and whatnot, because he knows who he is, and everybody knows who he is. He's established. Would mm -hmm. Abyss, the way he worked, start starting now with that work? I don't know. I, I really don't. And maybe it would, because it still does, but would he get the opportunity? That's all another story. I don't know. Like I said, maybe he would because he obviously could tell a story and he's really good at what he does. Really good. Um, I'm a big fan of Abyss. But I don't know coming into the business if that, if you just do that. But just coming in, he probably wouldn't be wrestling the same way. He probably would have adapted more, you know, something newer to the times. So, like I said, it, it is challenging. But, I, again, I, and I rely on my background my background makes me, makes me differ from any other big man, so to speak. I'm not saying that no other big man knows combat or, or took self-defense classes or does MMA or, you know, because they do. But I incorporated so much just the traditional karate standpoint. Uh, and I don't see anybody else doing that. No, at least nobody are my size. So exactly. it, it makes me stand out and it puts me on, a, on, my, on another uh, platform by myself, which I really enjoy. And I strive to do that. And that's what Ring of Honor lets me do, which is great. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Ring of Honor, by the way, has a new TV deal. They're, they're expanding their horizons. More eyes can get to the product. As a guy who's in the locker room, how much does that change over mean to you guys? That's uh, awesome. I mean, we're you're always crying. Our goal in the locker room is to make the product as good as possible. And, and I don't say that because I work for the company. Uh, in the time that I've been there, I've been so appreciative um, of my peers and, and those that were there before me just because of the way they treated me coming in. They, it wasn't you're an outsider and you got to pay dues. No, they didn't see me as that. They saw me as somebody. You're here. You're here for a reason. So we're going to help you become the best you because that's what we're all about. We're not about individually being the best we're about the product and when the product itself then starts raising the bar and getting tv deals and getting bigger opportunities because 
of what we're con- contributing, it makes us feel really, really good because we know we're doing our job. And obviously our job is to put on the best performance possible for our fans. And in turn, our fans want more content. So then now the company has to give them more content. And so it's just a revolving door of positivity, whether it's coming from the locker room, coming from the office, coming from the fans. So whenever things like this happen, it's very rewarding. We feel really good about it. Very cool. I wrote this down when you said it, and I didn't ask it next question, and I'm going to go back to it now. A word you threw out there when you were talking about Abyss and the big guy workers and that you didn't need to do, the word was dive. And I just wrote down dive uh, (laughs) because I wanted to go back to it. Of course, you know what I'm referencing, Randy Orton's. Actually, it was Rip Rogers who shared it first, but everybody gives it credit to Randy Orton and his critique of, of, of independent wrestling. How do you feel about that as a guy who's been on the independent scene? I don't consider ROH an indie, by the way, but as a guy who's been on the independent scene, how do you guys view the, that critique? See, I, don't, I, I didn't take it as a knock. I know, I know what he meant because um, he, when he said dives, obviously he means certain guys are, are just doing dives for no reason. They're just doing it to get a reaction. They don't know when or why they're doing it. They're just doing it because they know, I just want to get a reaction from the crowd opposed to it making sense. That's what he meant by it. He didn't mean that dives don't belong in wrestling because he wrestles with guys that do dives all the time. As a matter of fact, if you look at his, his stuff from early in his career, he was jumping off the top rope a lot, and he was doing different things that were more athletic than he shows now. He just doesn't have to now. But And it, it all comes down to those wow moments. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a dive. It's a wow moment. The dive was just a term that was used because, like you said, Rip used it. Um, That's right. I knew what he meant. And I knew what Rip meant as well. So I didn't take it like as an insult. I knew exactly what he meant. But fans that don't understand, of course, they tried to rip him apart. And this is when you talk about fans, because it, it did make a big deal because there was thousands of tweets about it. But when you look at the landscape of professional wrestling and fans and WWE fans, uh, it was a very small percentage of fan base that really had a problem with what he said. Um, yeah. And what I mean is with the wild moments is that he might not be the one coming off the top doing a, a shooting star, but he's the one catching you with an RKO. That's a wow moment. That's that moment in a match that's like, oh my God, you don't need to do that every match. You do it once in a while, but now that one time, you're going to be looking out for for something special. You never know when you might see it. And that's what I mean. And that's what he meant. Like, he doesn't need to do things all the time. And uh, and he wasn't insulting, let's say, someone like me. I don't, at least I don't think so. And he, he probably doesn't even know who I am, but he doesn't, he was insulting guys that, number one, are on TV and doing stuff that makes sense. He's, he's insulting the guys that just do things just to do them because they can't work. You know, and that's, that's the difference. Myself, uh, I don't, I can do a lot. And there's clips and gifs of me alone doing all this cool stuff. But if you watch my matches, it's, they're very far in between when I do these things. I do them when I feel I need to do them and if it makes sense for me to do it. I'm not going to do it just to kill myself and kill my opponent when I don't have to. You know, now there's certain guys that have to do that stuff and I get it. Maybe that's their style. Maybe it's because of their size. Um, but not everybody has to go out there and do everything in the book possible to get over. There's, And that's what he meant. And that, like I said, going back to the whole dive comment, he meant it as you need to be able to work before you need before you can fly. You need to understand why you're doing what you're doing and when you're doing it. And that's the way I took what he said. And I had no problem with what he said. And I agree with him 100%. Um, he said it in, uh, I don't know, it was an interview or comments after about that. He, he didn't wrestle in the Indies, but he wrestles with guys and he likes the Indies and he appreciates the Indies because a lot of guys come from the Indies now. Um, but I knew what he, like I said, I knew what he meant. It had nothing to do with, knocking people outside of WWE in general. It was just, a, it was certain people that he was attacking. Very good. Very good. Well, from the Indies, you developed your character, you developed your personal persona, but I have to think when you were working with huge personalities like the devil himself, like the taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan and working along or opposing uh, one of the best talkers to come out of ECW Steve Carino, that had to be something that was a learning experience and a half for you. Man, coming into Ring of Honor, so getting a job with a major company and then having to work alongside these guys is a pretty cool deal, I can't lie. 
uh, and developing a relationship with these people too, where I speak to, you know, these guys on a regular basis. Now I just spoke to Sullivan two days ago, <laughs> you know, we keep in touch and they, they, I still ask them questions. I still ask them to critique my stuff and give me advice and pointers. It's amazing. And you know, those two guys, geniuses, geniuses. They, I, I think they're so, well, and it, it, it doesn't matter what people know about them, but they're still underappreciated in this business where people don't understand how smart they are and how much they've done for professional wrestling, whether it's they themselves on camera or behind the scenes helping others um, raise their own bar. They've helped so many people along the way, and they, uh, which goes unnoticed by many, but not the people that they've helped. But they didn't do it for recognition either they did it because they love professional wrestling and that's something i really respect about them so getting to work with them was an honor a, a pleasure i can't say enough good things about them so that was amazing getting to work with them when i came into the company very cool and you also had some experiences with a guy that was on our show fairly recently it was uh, frankie casarian now frankie is an incredibly intelligent guy and i think he's I used the word analytical earlier. I think that pretty much describes him in a word. Um, how did you enjoy working with Frankie? Awesome. Awesome. And I got to work with Christopher Daniels, too, recently. So working oh, wow. both ends of that te of that team was fantastic. Frankie, number one, Frankie and I have a lot in common. Like, we like to say music. Uh, uh, we're just, and we, and we have similar personalities. and more laid back, more to ourselves. Um but man, that guy knows how to knows this business in and out. He's so smart. And it was really, really easy to work with him where sometimes when you get to work with somebody, you guys might butt heads or it might take you a little longer than with others to come up with something or an idea. Even in the ring, sometimes you don't flow with him. Everything was just flawless. Like it was just so easy. It was effortless. I felt like I was... Uh, maybe training, not not actually putting on a performance because it was so easy. And uh, same thing with, with CD. Um, they're just guys that just, man, they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we asked a little bit about Randy Orton's comments. I'm going to ask you about a couple other uh, comments that we've heard from the Newswire recently, uh, it, one of which was Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes said that he chose to stay in Ring of Honor because he saw more growth potential for the promotion than GFW or Impact or TNA, pick your name of the day. Do you agree with that assessment that there's more growth potential for Ring of Honor than maybe a company like GFW? I mean, I, I can't speak for GFW uh, or Impact, but you said I don't know what to call them because I've never worked there. He did. Mm -hmm. um, so he's speaking from experience. Uh, right. I can't, like I said, I can't speak on them. What I can speak on as far as Ring of Honor, um, like you said, we just got a new TV deal. Um, the, the partnership with New Japan and CMLL things keep growing every year. Now the War of the Worlds tour is moving to the UK, so now it's two War of the World Wars in, in, tours in one year. That's never been done. Each year the numbers raise as far as attendance and viewership and pay per view buys. Uh, so it's growing. I mean, they, the proof is in the pudding. Like it, it, every which way you look at it, I know I get the. Uh, the skepticism or even fear of the fans, like the, the, the loyal longtime fans where they say, oh, the company's going under because they're losing all their stars. Man, it's been, Ring of Honor has been like that since the start. What what guy that was there from the beginning? I mean, there's only a few. Maybe the the, the Briscoes, BJ's been there for a while. But there's not a lot of guys that, that have been there since day one. Everybody has moved on or moved away or, or retired or, you know, there's always a new crop of guys coming in. And that was, I think what Ring of Honor was basically based on it. It's creating new stars for the future and not future necessarily for other companies because it's also for Ring of Honor. Um, and that's what, that's what built Ring of Honor um, is that the fact that if somebody leaves, no, it's no sweat because there's plenty of guys waiting to kick down the, to kick open that door. They're right there. They're just waiting for that opportunity. And there's only so many, spots available so trust me when somebody leaves um ring of honor is always happy and and one of the lives to let open that door for somebody else because they know that there's so many guys that are so talented just waiting uh to, for, to be given an opportunity um 
that's how I earned my opportunity. You know, I was just there, right there, right there. And finally, you know, a roster spot opened up and boom, there, there I was, you know, right time, right place. Um, so as far as growth and ring of honor, I see it all the time. I mean, this year alone, we got Josh Woods and we got Flip Gordon, the most recent guys that are coming in. I think those guys are going to be huge stars in pro wrestling. Um, they're just starting out and their look, their, their charisma, it's, off the charts. I can't wait till next year's top prospect tournament. I can only imagine what that's going to be like because every year seems to be like better and better and better. And it's the same thing. And so as far as growth, like I said, speaking from what I see because what I'm around in my immediate bubble, uh, I understand why he said there's growth in Ring of Honor because it's, it is. It's there. Now, Impact, I, I can't speak for I don't work there. So if he made those comments, uh, I like Cody, so I'm going <laughs> to kind of believe what he said but he didn't say that there's there isn't any room there he just said he saw that more here that's right exactly so exactly all right so another comment was from sean waltman and sean waltman was saying that it's a fantastic time to be a wrestler and to be a wrestling fan now i actually agree with parts of what he said but i wanted to get your guys to take it you know you've been in the pen, in the business for a little while now is now a good time for for wrestling for wrestling nationally and internationally Oh, it's a great time. And I know why he said it. Just, I mean, there's so many different platforms um, to watch wrestling, number one. And number two, there's so many different avenues and styles. So if you don't like one type of wrestling, there's here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. And they're all easily accessible. That's the one thing. All these styles have been around forever. The only difference was there wasn't a way to watch them. Now, with social media being so big and so important in, in, in the world, it's so easy to watch anything. You know, New Japan and Japanese wrestling has been around for a while. Me, as a kid, I never saw it because I didn't have the access. You know, the, the tape trading, I didn't, the scene wasn't that big around me, so I, I didn't have the privilege to get tapes and watch tapes, not very often. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I didn't get to see any Japanese wrestling or very little Mexican wrestling. I remember as far as Spanish wrestling, I would watch if I get lucky once in a while, maybe when I was a little kid and when I lived in Puerto Rico, but it really wasn't accessible. Now I could watch anything I want, anything. Mm -hmm. You can watch any style, any company at any time. And that's why it's a really good time to be a professional wrestling fan. And for all those what fans that complain, go ahead. What did, I was going to ask, what is your take? You mentioned all different styles. What is your take on such a wacky style? It's just a different style of something like Lucha Underground. Uh, man, everything has its place. I, I've always said, and cause now I'm actually a coach at the monster factory. Oh, okay. so, and, and what I tell the students is this, cause they say, Hey, is this okay to do this? Is, is, does this make sense? The beautiful thing about professional wrestling, everything, anything can be done as long as you can make it make sense for the moment that you're in. And what I mean by that is that, Anything you do, anything that we do, and, I'm, and I don't mean just in a match, it could be while we're speaking, it could be while we're walking, but anything we do, if, you could, if I ask you, why did you do that? If you have a reason, a believable and understanding reason, then it has its place. They have a reason why they do things that they do. They can explain it, so I say that it's okay. It might not be for everybody's taste. I might not be necessarily a big fan of, like, I can't watch maybe the, out of the wrestling aspect, some of them, um, where they're murdering guys, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I could still appreciate some of the in-ring work. I could still appreciate some of the matches. Um, they have a ph phenomenal roster. So, and I know some of those guys they are really good. So wow. I could appreciate that. Like I said, not everything's for everybody, but there should be something for somebody somewhere. Uh, and that's, that, like I said, that's why it's so good now that there's different avenues to watch things. Now they're on Netflix. So anytime, anything, any type, any company can draw a new fans of professional wrestling, that's a good thing. Absolutely. That's a really good thing. All right. So I got a couple more questions and I'll let you go because I know I've kept you a while. So I appreciate your time, by the way. I do appreciate you taking this time. With no, us. good. Shoot away. I'm, I'm good. All right. So one of the guys you came through ROH with, or at least got signed with, or at least shortly thereafter, was Leo Rush. And I'm going to throw one more quote at you. He said that basically everybody who ever laces up the boots, their goal should be to go to WWE. 
from somebody like you, who is a huge guy, you would think that that would be something that they would be interested in. Vince McMahon still loves his big guys. Is that a goal of yours at all, to go to WWE? Um, of course, when I first started, like, Leo's still, you know, three years in. So when I was three years in, of course, that was my goal. I'm a different place right now. My goal is to, is to do what I love and make a living at it. Of course, if I could do certain things that could be better uh, financially fitting for me, you know, if it presents itself, of course. But I, I set different goals for myself, you know, and this was – I had started a transformation about four years ago uh, on myself, and it was basically, you know, I pretty much changed my whole life, my whole training regimen and do the way I am, like, working out and, you know, really giving it a hundred for this business, which I didn't do previously. And that's why it took me so long. Um, but I said, now I said, not, not so much super short term goals, but more realistic where I, this is what I want right now. And then once I accomplish that, this is what I want now. So my goal was to sign a contract with Ring of Honor. I got it. Then it was to have a match in Japan. I got that. Okay. I want to main event a show. I did that. Right. Now my next goal is I want to be a champion, you know, and then, and, and so forth and so forth. Like that, that's how I, I perceive it. Now, of course you have big goals, you know, headlining you know, events or getting to work a main event. Like I, a big goal of mine would be to wrestle at the Tokyo Dome at a Wrestle Kingdom. That is a That'd huge awesome. goal of mine. I would love to, I would love to be able to do that. That's what, that is a big time goal right now. Um, mm -hmm. If I said I never wanted to work for the WWE, that I'd be lying. I mean, I, I think anybody would be lying. I hear it all the time, and I start laughing. I heard a kid say it the other day, and he was a teenager wanting to be a wrestler one day, and he said, I would never go to WWE, and I started laughing. I said, why not? He goes, because they make wrestling look bad. And I, I cracked up, and I said, man, I was like, you don't get pro wrestling, but that's okay because you're just a kid. <laughs> you know, you'll grow up one day, and you'll understand if this is what you want to do. Um, but so I understand why he said it, and – at his age, I completely understand why he said what he said, because um, I would have said the same thing. And that's and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong for him to believe that's his goal, but I don't believe that should that has to be everybody's goal, because everybody's different. Everybody's different, and everybody has the right to have their own goals and dreams. Those are his, and he is obviously more than deserving to have them, and he, he's going to have a bad future. I'm sure he's going to have a long career in the WWE eventually, you know, because I could see it. And Ring of Honor saw it, and that's why Ring of Honor had him had him work for them at a first time. Um, Absolutely. But I do believe that th that depends on each person. Everybody's different, um, and if that's everybody's goal, then that's going to be a lot of uh, broken hearts. Because realistically, how many spots are there? <laughs> you exactly know? right. Exactly right. All right, man. Well, I'm going to let this uh, uh, finish up with just a couple, just one more question here, and that is. What is your primary goal? I know you said you want to be a champion. Is there a particular title you're looking at? Is it Ring of Honor World Title? Uh, right now, uh, working for the company, that's the ultimate title as far as working for Ring of Honor. If eventually to become the world champion. Um, but I understand. I like to crawl before I walk. I like baby steps. I like to um, work my way into something. So I can't. I wouldn't want to go straight to the top. I mean, if it happens, it happens. <laughs> but first championship goal would be a television title for me there you go uh, there you go. and then obviously like i said i love to wrestle at wrestle kingdom there you go and and then you know i said like like i said work from there you know earn there opportunities and keep uh and keep taking advantage of them you know because we only get so many that's true that's true all right uh, just out of curiosity between you and me and, and anybody listening out there, you know, we mentioned you mentioned you were at Survivor Series 96. I was there, too. I was at WrestleMania 10. I was at a lot of those garden shows that you were at. I was at the uh, the click incident. Um, right. Just out of curiosity, where was it? When was it that you saw these guys and thought and what wrestler was it that kind of reached out to you and said this is going to be something that could be in your future? Well, I remember. Like, are you speaking live, or are you speaking just a moment that I remember watching? Maybe you're watching on TV. Either or, either or, whichever comes to you first. Okay. Well, I remember when I lived in Puerto Rico. I was probably ten, nine or ten, and I remember the Undertaker stuffing the Ultimate Warrior in a casket, and they couldn't get the casket open, and they were going crazy because he couldn't get air. And, and Vince McMahon is going, he can't breathe in there. Yeah, I remember. it was. Yeah. 
I, I, I have a horrible memory. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, from my childhood, I, I, I remember like images almost. I, could, I can't remember a lot of things, but that is like crystal clear that day. And I remember that it was on two different channels at the same time. It was in Spanish and in English. And I was going back and forth just because I wanted to hear the, the, the difference in the, the way the, the announcers were yelling. And then I showed my mom. I was like, Mom, look at this. They're going back and forth. And my mom said, Stop changing the channel. I just want to see what's going to happen. <laughs> and then, you know, I stopped and we were just, and then I watched it with my mom and she didn't watch wrestling. She didn't care for it. But that moment she did because she wanted to see if the guy was going to die or not. Uh, and that got me hooked, The, the Undertaker. And I, I, since I was 10 years old, The Undertaker was my guy. I mean, every time he was on the screen, I'm like, this is the guy that almost killed you off the water. I want to see what he's going to do. You know, and so, so since I was a little kid, that moment made me basically fall in love with, with professional wrestling. Um, awesome. when I wanted to become one, I don't remember exactly, but I do know it had to do with basically the cool guys. Like when Razor Ramon, first of all, was so cool to me. <laughs> uh, and when he and Nash left the WCW and they formed the NWO, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be that cool. Undertaker was always my favorite and I always wanted to be like him, of course, but I never wanted to be in front of people like on camera and be that cool there was you know a like thing you know i tell people this i've said this on this show several times it was really weird because you and i you know both both grew up in the northeast and wcw was the down south company and they always talked about up north but at survivor series i remember there was a lot of nwo t-shirt that night there was so a many. lot of nwo yeah it was really weird kind of like bizarro land to see the 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 competition had kind of invaded Oh yeah, I remember that, and and I remember watching because they there was so many there was guys. I remember that night that there was guys holding up signs and they were wearing the NWO shirt and had an NWO sign. They were going around the arena like and they're circling it, and so, you know. And I remember kept on seeing them, um, and I didn't cheer for them because I didn't want the crowd to like you know boo me because they because people were yelling at them. But I remember thinking I was like, man, those guys are cool because the NWO is cool, <laughs> yeah. uh, and. So being a WWF guy, I never really admitted that I was into WCW because of them, but I so was. They they were the only reason I started watching WCW. Um, and then I have videotapes now that I, if I was to play it and if I could find a VCR and play it, it would be like an old Raw. And then during it, you'd, you'd hear, and it would cut to, the, to to Nitro because I used to, I was recording live and switching channels back and forth. <laughs> just to see if the NWO was on. If the NWO wasn't on, I'd go back back to Raw. But when the NWO was on, I'd stay and watch it. Um, but yeah, those guys are the ones that made me want to be on TV because I was like, I want to be cool like them on TV. Uh, awesome, so, yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your time here tonight. Last favor to ask of you. Do you mind giving me a little liner just saying this is Punishment Martinez and you're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio? Sure. All right. Do you want me to count you down? Sure. I'll do the whole Wayne's World thing. Here Inter interactive here. Wrestling Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Yes, sir. Okay. In five, four, three, two. This is Punishment Martinez from Ring of Honor. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio. Awesome, man. You got a great voice. <laughs> you really do. <did. laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. it. Enjoying what you're hearing? Be sure and check out WrestlingEpicenter.com on social media at Facebook.com slash Wrestling Epicenter. On Twitter at James Epicenter. And of course, WrestlingEpicenter.com for 24-hour news updates, our interview archives, and all the other information you've come to expect from the Wrestling Epicenter.